in this class we will be talking about harmonic analysis or frequency based analysis. So, just to recapitulate till now we have been able to derive the wave equation, we went into some length in deriving the solution and also explaining the physical import of the solution. So, the solution of the one dimensional wave equation in particular was dealt with in great details and we came up with this inference that the wave equation solution is of this form f uh, which is a function of x plus tau and g which is a function of x minus tau. So, uh, this f and g were basically left undetermined, the general solution is such that f and g could be anything at that point. The actual functions f and g were specified only through a proper specification of in initial condition which was done in the case of let us say de Alembert solution and also when there is a reflection at the boundary that sort of interrelates the f and g which is what we saw when we studied the reflection. Alternatively, we could have just transformed the g function into an h function, the two being just the flipped versions of each other. So, g of x minus tau is basically h of tau minus x. So, any of these methods are just perfectly feasible, it is just that we use one of these formalisms probably to understand one aspect of the wave solution in better details and we may use the other form to understand some other aspect, but both of these are completely equivalent. The important import as I said is that the functions f, g and h are arbitrary and they may be interrelated due to certain boundary conditions, Dirichlet and Neumann boundary conditions is what we talked about and also we found out how to actually evaluate this function from the uh, initial conditions which was the D'Alembert solution. But from here on we will specify a specific form of f and g, we will not go for arbitrary forms of f and g. We have uh, in the examples demonstrated the triangular wave form as one specific form, but usually in most acoustic applications that we are going to deal with from here on, we are not going to deal with such arbitrary functional form, rather we are going to deal with a very specific form of this function f and that is <coughs> dictated by the application. So, <coughs> so, I make an opening comment and I will elaborate in due course that in most of applications of interest, the point is that the characteristic of the sound do not change with time and when that happens, we say that the sound is said to be in steady state. Please note that I am not saying that the sound is invariant. I am just sort of loosely qualifying that the characteristic of the sound does not change. What do I mean by characteristics of sound? Characteristics as we understand colloquially is something about loudness, is something about pitch, is something about quality of the sound. But anyway, without getting into technicalities at this point, it suffices to say that when we mean the characteristics of sound should not change, we simply mean that these aspects of sound should not change. For example, when you whistle at a constant tone such as this, in all through this you are hearing a constant characteristics of sound, right. It is not changing, it is not changing in loudness, it is not changing in terms of its frequency or pitch or tonal characteristics, right. Whereas, my talking or if I actually start whistling in, in a, uh, uh, for a song, then obviously the tonal characteristics and the loudness will change, right. So, that would be an example of a non-steady state behavior or what can be qualified as a transient behavior. Whereas, a steady state characteristics implies that perceptibly the, the perception of sound does not change over the duration that it is being played with. A more uh, a realistic example from uh, let us say the uh, machine acoustics point of view would be if you are looking at uh, engine which is running at a constant speed and nothing is changing, constant speed, constant load everything is same. Obviously, the engine makes noise, but then the noise of the engine does not change provided that the conditions at which the engine is running is not changing, right. But then if you are revving up the engine let us say you put your vehicle in neutral and just keep throttling up your accelerator. 
then you can hear that the sound characteristics of the engine is changing, right. So, that would be an example of a non steady or a transient acoustic behavior as opposed to the first example where the perception of sound does not change, right. So, <coughs> that is what at this stage we will call it as a steady state behavior of sound, but steady state does not mean that if you were to take the acoustic pressure plot over time, it does not mean that the pressure will be dead constant that is not implied. It simply means that whatever is the variation in time, that variation in time is identically repeated, right. So, we will come to all those aspects as we go along, but at this point I hope you agree that at least in machine noise application, there will be lot of applications where the characteristics of the sound is not changing with time and therefore, it is said to be in steady state. As I am talking in the background, you are hearing this air conditioned noise which is uh, sort of just perceptible, right. But the characteristics of that AC noise is not changing with time, right. It is sort of held constant. So, that is again an example of a steady state noise. So, from here on we will be interested in steady state noise as opposed to transient noise, right. Transient noise is music or uh, music is not noise, but uh, examples which are ruled out from steady state acoustic behavior is music, voice, these are all examples of non steady state uh, signals and you need uh, a different framework to analyze them, which is not possible in the framework that we are going to uh, <coughs> go for. In the present framework, we are only being, uh, we will only be able to analyze the steady state acoustic behavior and it is pertinent for you to know under what uh, context this steady state acoustic behavior is feasible. So, to that extent, you must be very careful in using this assumption in real application problems which you encounter, ok. The reason why steady state makes it very simple is that what we are going to show right now in today's lecture is that for steady state sound, we will be able to use Fourier analysis results to simplify the form of these f, g and h functions. In particular, we will here on look from uh, look at the solution in the form of f and h. So, we will see that based on the Fourier analysis results, we will be able to simplify the form of the f and h function. It will not be left as arbitrary or a general form. We will now tie it up to a very specific form and that will be based on our <coughs> results of Fourier analysis, ok. Before we get at uh, the Fourier analysis in depth, let us have a quick recap of the build up to the Fourier analysis and we will start with periodic quantities. As the name suggests, quantities which repeat periodically in time are called periodic quantities. The obvious example are cos of n t and sin of n t and if in, you can even have combinations of this cos and sin functions, all of these are periodic quantities. <coughs> but a more general example would be a arbitrary function f such that f of small t plus capital T is equals to f of t. So, or rather <coughs> this is the uh, definition of the periodic quantities that any quantity x of t which satisfies this relation that is x at any time t is equals to x at that time plus a shifted time of capital T. This uh, uh, a function which is represented in this form is called as a periodic function, right. And uh, 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 these periodic functions are very important from the concept of analysis of steady state acoustic behavior or any other steady state, steady state quantities. So, this capital T which is the minimum time after which this signal repeats is called the time period and we will see that frequency analysis is essentially sort of built on this aspect. Uh, uh, you should be able to convince yourself that cos of n t plus or sin of n t does fit this bill, because let us say if you take cos of n t, then the minimum time after which it repeats is 2 pi by n, right. 
So, that should be clear to you, I will do that calculation on the same. So, we will see that cos, the question is to prove cos of n t is periodic, right. So, the proof is quite simple, all that we have to find is we have to find some capital T such that cos of n t plus capital T is equals to cos of n t, right. So, obviously, we know from properties of a trigonometric function that if capital T is chosen to be 2 pi by n, I should say small t plus capital T, okay, cos of n times if I change this small t to small t plus capital T that should give me the result which is same as the argument being small t. So, if I choose this capital T to be 2 pi by n we get to see cos of n times small t plus 2 pi by n is going to be cos of n t plus 2 pi and that is obviously cos of n t from properties of trigonometric function. So, therefore, 2 pi by n is the periodicity of this function, right. Remember it is the smallest time after which the repetition will definitely happen. You could also say if I had chosen capital T as just 2 pi, even then you would have seen that cos of n times t plus 2 pi would be cos of n t plus 2 pi n. And if n is an integer, then if n is a positive integer, then obviously this will also be cos of n t. But then if you have an ambiguity that whether we should choose 2 pi by n or 2 pi, then you should fall back to the definition of periodicity which says that periodicity is the minimum time possible such that the condition is met, the condition being f of t is equals to f of small t plus capital T. So, the minimum time would be this. So, this is, this is lesser 2 pi by n has to be lesser than 2 pi because n is a positive integer and thereby you get this logic that 2 pi by n is the periodicity of this, right. Similarly, if you have a more uh, involved function, let us say like cos of t plus cos of 2 t, right. So, the periodicity of cos of t is 2 pi, but the periodicity of cos of 2 t is pi, right. However, when you look at the sum of it, cos of t plus cos of 2 t, the sum of it will have a periodicity of 2 pi, right. Because if cos of 2 t is repeating after every pi intervals of time, it is also repeating at 2 pi intervals of time. But cos of t repeats only at 2 pi, it does not repeat at pi, right. So, therefore, the sum of cos t and cos plus 2 t, uh, uh, sum of cos 2 t and cos 2 t will repeat at 2 pi, not at pi, right. So, the periodicity associated with this 2 pi is called the fundamental periodicity, right. Every other components will have harmonic multiples of this fundamental. So, these are certain things which hopefully you have come across in a first course in engineering mathematics in Fourier analysis or if you have taken vibrations, these things would have been dealt with and just briefly touching upon them. So, just to indicate what is the periodicity here I have taken three different functions sin t cos 2 t and sin t plus cos 2 t, right. So, the one that is shown in blue is sin t as you can see the distance between peak to peak is this capital T, this is after this is the time interval after which this graph will repeat itself, right. So, 
looking at the graph also, sometimes when you are dealing with a certain function which is very difficult to write it in terms of analytical form, but then you can always graph it. Looking at the graph also, you should be able to decipher what is the associated time period by simply realizing at what time interval you should shift this graph such that the entire picture repeats itself. So, here in the blue graph we see that the time period is marked as capital T. <coughs> For the red graph which is cos of 2 t, the associated time period will be this peak to peak distance. It could be any two points which are at the identical locations on this uh, graph. So, here again we see that the uh, peak to peak distance in the red graph is halved to the peak compared to the peak to peak distance in the blue graph, right. That is because you are dealing now with a function which is cos of 2 t. Accordingly, the periodicity of this is pi, whereas sin of t has a periodicity of 2 pi. So, the periodicity of the blue graph which is sin of t is more than the periodicity of the red graph, right. Now, if you look at a superposition of both of them, you see that the waveform repeats only from here to here, right, which is something like 2 pi, right. So, this, this is 6 and it has started slightly off uh, 0. So, this would be roughly at 2 pi which is 6.28, right. And similarly, here also this, this distance is 6.28. So, the black curve will have actually the periodicity corresponding to the lower frequency. Here you see sin t and cos 2 t, it is made up of two components, one with a frequency 2 pi, the uh, sorry, one with a periodicity 2 pi and the other with a periodicity phi, uh, uh, with a periodicity pi. The sum of the two functions will have a periodicity which is comprising, which is exactly equal to the periodicity of the component bearing the largest time period. So, this is uh, adequately demonstrated through this illustration. Carrying on, let us now consider a signal of this form. So, instead of cos of n t and sin of n t, we will choose to write it as 2 pi f into t. The argument within the sin or cosine function could be written as 2 pi f. Then we can uh, easily say that x of t plus 1 by f. So, instead of t, I will replace t plus 1 by f. So, this is what it stands out. And when you do that algebra, you get to see a 2 pi popping out here. 2 pi f multiplied by 1 by f is going to give me a 2 pi. So, therefore, x sin of 2 pi f t plus 2 pi is again sin of 2 pi f t which is back to x of t. So, what we have here is that if you have a sin function of this form, then the periodicity of that sin function is exactly 1 by f. So, whatever is the time period that can be easily uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, memorized or if you can call derived <coughs> by this simple formula that the time period is 1 by f. f is called the frequency, right. So, f will be called as the frequency, the units of which is cycles per second or hertz. So, the time period is related to the frequency in a reciprocal fashion as has been shown in this line. So, the crucial point to remember is that what has been shown actually here is that the signal will repeat itself, the signal or the function will repeat itself after every 1 by f units of time, right because x of t plus 1 by f is just the same as x of t. It is just that the entire signal gets repeated after such a shift. So, in a unit time, therefore, the signal repeats f times. So, if let us say f is uh, 10, right. So, in <coughs> the signal will repeat itself 10 times in a, in a second, if times unit is second, right and conversely that the signal uh, repeats every 1 by f units of time will now mean that the time period is 1 by 10 if f is assumed to be 10 just for illustration. So, in this context if you now uh, look at this interpretation of f that I am bringing out that f basically denotes how many times the signal repeats in a unit interval of time. 
So, in this context it represents how frequently the signal repeats over a unit time span and thereby we derive this nomenclature that it is called frequency because it denotes how many times the signal repeats itself in a unit time span, right. So, that is the interpretation of frequency which I bring about at this stage. And as I said the time period and frequency are just related through a reciprocal relation which should be obvious. The units of frequency are cycles per second or hertz provided time is in seconds, right. So, here on that will be assumed that the time that we are looking for is in seconds. We are not talking about normalized time as we did in the previous module where we were just trying to extract uh, uh, equation of uh, the, we are trying to extract the solution for the plane wave equation where we rescale time. Here we will stick to our usual definition of time. So, if the usual definition of time we have the units to be second and accordingly the usual frequency units will be cycles per second which is abbreviated as hertz. Okay. Uh, there is another way in which we find it very useful to interpret this idea of frequency which is possibly that not obvious at least in the first course of uh, engineering mathematics and that is called the phasor diagrams and that is what I wish to illustrate to you. So, phasor is a rotating vector and it is represented in this form a e to the power i omega t plus phi. And as you know by using complex number uh, theory this e to the power i omega t plus phi is also e to the power i phi into e to the power i omega t right a remains as it is. A is has to be a positive number it cannot be a negative number it cannot it is not, a, not even a complex number at this stage. So, what we do is that we assume that this there is a vector which is rotating and the vector length is a and it is rotating as per our convention in a counter clockwise sense. So, if you have such a rotating vector which rotates in a counter clockwise sense the projection of that rotating vector on the real axis is just the real part of this uh, uh, of this complex number. So, the complex number is written as a e to the power i omega t I have forgotten the plus phi. So, please bear with me on that. So, real part of a e to the power i omega t plus phi is a cos omega t plus phi right projection on the imaginary axis similarly will be imaginary part of a e to the power i omega t plus phi which gives me a sin omega t plus phi. We have already seen that sin and cosine are the fundamental examples of periodic quantities right. So, what we are doing is that now instead of talking in terms of sin and cosine we will talk in terms of real or imaginary parts of this sort of a complex exponential. Right. So, this complex exponential is uh, representation is that which is associated with a phasor. <coughs> so, it is not just the projection on the real axis or imaginary axis which happens to be a, uh, uh, having this sinusoidal kind of behavior. If you take projection along any fixed axis, projection along any fixed axis will be having this sort of a harmonic nature as we will see this is therefore, a very uh, uh, fundamental example of periodic quantities. And these are also called harmonic quantities we will we'll just now distinguish between what is a difference between a harmonic quantity and a periodic quantity. Periodic quantity is anything which repeats itself after a periodic period of time. For example, in here sin t plus cos cosine of 2 t is a periodic quantity it repeats itself, but it is not harmonic. Harmonic means it has to have a phasor representation alternatively it has to have a single frequency sin t and cosine t 2 t can be represented as a phasor. You could talk of cosine 2 t as real part of e to the power i 2 t right. You could have talked about sin of t as imaginary part of e to the power i t right. You could have also talked about sin of t as real part of e to the power i t minus pi by 2 
each of these things are possible, right. So, sin t and cos 2 t can be expressed in terms of a phasor, which is in terms of a complex exponential and then take real or imaginary part as is appropriate. But sin t plus cosine 2 t or cosine t plus cosine 2 t you cannot express it in this form because you require two frequency components which is not allowed as per uh, the phasor representation. So, therefore, harmonic quantities are those quantities which can be represented in this complex exponential form, right. However, there are periodic quantities which are not harmonic that means they have multiple frequencies, right they may be harmonically re related, the frequencies may be integer multiples of each other as you saw in the example of cos t plus cosine of 2 t, it is periodic, but it is not a harmonic quantity. Harmonic quantity means there has to be a single frequency, alternatively it should permit a phasor representation. I think I can write this part for you here. So, harmonic quantities can be expressed in the form of a phasor or complex exponential. Example, cosine of t is just the real part of e to the power i t, sine of t could be expressed as imaginary part of e to the power i t, it could also be expressed as real part of e to the power i t minus pi by right. Just check that out. Real part of e to the power i t minus pi by 2 is cos of t minus pi by 2 plus i of sin of t minus pi by 2, right. This can be written as real part of cos of pi by 2 minus t i times sin of pi by 2 minus t. So, that would become real part of sin of t minus i times cos of t and that is sin of t. Okay. So, similarly if there are any other uh, frequencies, so if I put an omega here, I could put an omega here also. right? So, any quantities of the form cos omega t or sin omega t can have a complex exponential representation. This is not possible for arbitrary periodic quantities. comprising of multiple frequencies, okay. If there are multiple frequencies, then example of that would be cos of t plus sin of 2 t. You cannot express that into a single complex exponential and thereby it will not be a harmonic quantity, but it will be a periodic quantity nevertheless. So, the important point is harmonic quantities are obviously periodic, but it is more than periodic in the sense that it is periodic with a single frequency, whereas periodic quantities may have multiple frequencies also. Okay. So, harmonic quantities are periodic as I said, but the beauty of Fourier analysis lies in this converse statement that it is trivial to understand that any harmonic quantity is a periodic quantity, 
But what Fourier analysis gives us is that any periodic quantity can be dealt with as a superposition of multiple harmonic quantities, right. So, it is not a single harmonic, but it is a multiple harmonic. So, if you are seeing on your graph that something is repeating in its pattern every capital T units of time, then what Fourier analysis assures you is that you can break this up into multiple harmonic components, which is what the result of Fourier analysis gives us and that is what we will quickly review as we go along. But before that let me just illustrate the concept of phasor once again with this diagram. So, what we are talking about is that we have this vector which is rotating and by our convention it is rotating in the counter clockwise sense as is indicated with this curved arrow. It is rotating at a speed of omega, right and phi denotes the orientation of this vector with respect to the real axis let us say at time t equals to 0. At time t equals to 0 the vector arrow is inclined in a counterclockwise sense with respect to the real axis by an angle phi right. And <coughs> what we could do is the following a e to the power i omega t plus phi could be written as a e to the power i phi into e to the power i omega t and a e to the power i phi this time if we uh, club these two terms we call this a tilde right. So, this a tilde is what is called a complex amplitude because if a is real because of the presence of e to the power i phi which is cos phi plus i sin phi a multiplied by e to the power i phi is going to be complex it is not going to be real anymore. So, associatedly we call this a tilde as a complex amplitude. So, as opposed to real amplitude which only bears the uh, information of the length of this vector, this complex amplitude which is in its magnitude a, but if you take the phase associated with it the phase will be phi. So, the complex amplitude will not only indicate the length of the vector, it will also indicate the orientation of the vector at time t equals to 0. So, this complex amplitude will be is what is going to be used predominantly in Fourier analysis and also in our analysis of waves. So, we will embed in other words the phase information right. The phase information phi will be embedded in this complex amplitude as opposed to real amplitude. What we mean by complex amplitude is precisely this, the complex amplitude magnitude of the complex amplitude is the amplitude which you would measure off in an oscilloscope being the amplitude of the signal, but the phase part of the complex amplitude will denote the phase of your harmonic quantity, which is in other words pictorially just the initial orientation of your phasor, right. So, A is called the amplitude, but A tilde is called the complex amplitude. Omega is called the angular frequency. There is uh, one needs to be a little careful in the usage of this word frequency. There are two types of frequencies that we have encountered by now. One is the angular frequency as I am talking here and the other was F which is circular frequency uh, sorry omega is the angular frequency or circular frequency and um, F is the frequency in cycles per second or hertz and it is not that omega and f are same. In fact, omega and f are related and I uh, would like you to derive what is the relation between omega and f, right. So, it, <coughs> there is two notions of frequency, one is the angular frequency, by angular frequency we simply denote what is the rate of rotation of this phasor, right. So, uh, in effect if you are taking the real part of this uh, let us say uh, phasor, what you are going to get is a cos omega t plus phi, right. And what we had shown earlier was that we had equation of this form representing simple sinusoidal or a harmonic quantity. So, therefore, omega turns out to be 2 pi f, okay. So, the exercise is just solved in 2 minutes, okay. Phi is called the phase. And let us take a few examples here. So, here I have a phasor which starts from the horizontal position as is indicated in this uh, illustration. I also have a blue vector which starts from the horizontal position, but it rotates at 2 omega as opposed to omega for the 
red vector, right. So, accordingly the real part of this rotating vector will be cos of omega t and the real part of this rotating vector will be cos of 2 omega t. So, this is the graph corresponding to this phasor. So, the real part of this rotating vector is shown in the red line. You see that the time period associated with the red graph looks very uh, close to 6.28, right. This is 5, this is 10. So, this is somewhere at 6.28. So, this is the time period associated with the projection on the real axis of this red rotating vector which is at rotating at omega. Omega has been taken as 1 when I, uh, 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 when I did draw this graph. Now, if on top of it, if I look at what happens when you have a blue vector which starts from an identical position at time t equals to 0, but rotates at 2 omega. Obviously, it will complete the cycle faster than the red vector, right. And it will complete the cycle at half the time because it is rotating at double the speed, right. So, therefore, by the time the red vector comes through one cycle, the blue rotating vector would have come through two cycles, which is exactly what is seen here. If you look at this point, by this point, the blue vector has actually traveled two cycles, right. And accordingly, the time period for the blue phasor is half of the time period of the red one, right. So, the time period is <coughs> therefore, given by this quantity, which is <coughs> something like pi, right. Now, let us see what happens if instead of orienting these vectors at horizontally to start with, we orient these vectors at minus pi by 2. So, the starting position this time is not aligned to the positive x axis, rather it is aligned to the negative y axis or the negative imaginary axis. So, in this case, it starts from here, just imagine as this rotate vector rotates, the projection of it on the real axis will grow. At this instant, what happens is that the projection of this red vector on the real axis is dead 0. As it rotates, the projection, the shadow on this horizontal axis will keep increasing, right. So, it will behave like a sign, right. And after it has traveled pi by 2, it has actually taken the position of indicated by this diagram. So, in other words, this red phasor is lagging with this red phasor by an angle of pi by 2. Whatever happened to this red phasor will also happen with this red phasor, but after a lapse of pi by 2, uh, if that is omega is taken as uh, 1, which is what has been drawn here, right. So, what you must understand is that both cosines and sines are different incarnations of the same phasor. The only difference being that you are your starting time is different. At the starting time, rather at the starting time t equals to 0, the orientation of the phasor is different. But other than this, the effect of cosine and sine is completely equivalent and therefore, it is we are actually going not going to make a big fuss about a cosine and sine, both are complex exponentials except for the fact that they have a phase difference. So, omega here is uh, for omega equals to 1, I have again plotted out the graph. Here you can see the periodicity is somewhere here. So, it started with 0, it comes back with 0 round about here, which is again 6.28. And by the time it has come here, the blue phasor, which is now started with, uh, with its alignment being in the minus y axis and rotating at twice the speed by exactly identical arguments by this much time it would have crossed two cycles and which means that the time period associated with this blue signal would be half of it which is pi, right. So, this is what uh, the some extremes that I have shown and here is one other example where I have taken two of these phasors which are uh, both at different uh, uh, both at different orientation as well as different amplitudes. So, both of them as you see are looking like a sinusoid except for a shift. Cosine starts with its maximum, sine starts with its with a 0 value, but if you have an arbitrary orientation 
of this phasor at time t equals to 0 which is what is shown in this diagram. It will neither start from its maximum point nor start from its minimum point, but other than that the nature is completely same. It is going to repeat again at the same uh, 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 rates, right. So, same is taken for this uh, plot which is shown in this dotted line, right. <coughs> By the way, the omega that has been taken here is different. The, uh, looks like from here to here it is about uh, omega is not taken as 1 here. So, the periodicity here is looks like 2. Okay. So, this is 0.25 and this is 2.25, right. This is 2.25. So, the periodicity is 2 here. So, accordingly the omega has been adjusted. Periodicity remember is 2 pi by omega, right. So, the 2 pi by omega quantity has been taken as 2 in this plot, whereas in these plots which has been generated using a different software, the omega has been taken as 1, okay. <coughs> Similarly, for the dotted phasor, the dotted phasor you see now it has a greater amplitude also. The fact that the length of the rotating vector is different it has manifested with a higher values of the peaks and of the troughs of this signal, right. This function has now shown a higher values because it is having a greater length. The shadow of this as it will fall on the real axis will be higher at some point of time. And the phase also is different, it has not started with the uh, with the sine position or in the cosine position, it has started with some arbitrary positions. Okay. So, in some of the assignments you will be asked to plot the functions associated or the graphs associated with uh, different phase and you should be comfortable with the phasor representation of harmonic quantities. Okay. So, just to consolidate it, uh, consolidate our ideas. So, the angular speed of the phasor associated with the periodic quantity is called the angular frequency. Angular frequency, it is just the speed of this rotating vector and therefore, the units of it will be radians per second, not cycles per second, not hertz. So, please do not con uh, confuse between frequency and angular frequency. Angular frequency is in radians per second, time being measured in seconds. So, the time period is 2 pi by omega it is also given as 1 by f. So, omega and f are related therefore, as omega equals to 2 pi times f. And the length of the rotating vector is the amplitude, maximum minimum value is in that is encountered in any graph of this signal is also called the amplitude. The maximum and minimum value will remain the same because there is no DC component, there is no constant component. So, the maximum and minimum value is also called the amplitude which effectively is the same as the length of the rotating vector. Phasors are also called harmonic quantities, right, because as we discussed basically you can have phasor representation possible only if you have a single harmonic quantity. If you have more than one harmonic quantity superposed, then it is a periodic quantity, but it is not a phasor, it is not a simple harmonic quantity in other words. Okay. So, why do we go for this phasor representation? As we will see that the use of this complex amplitude uh, representation a e to the power i omega t and I do not put this tilde again and again. When I write a e to the power i omega t it, from here on it should be assumed that a is a complex number as opposed to a real number, right. Because now we understand that there is an interpretation for complex amplitude. So, when we write it in this form the first advantage in at least the notational terms is that we are making a very compact notation for our mathematical process and the compact notation uh, clubs in this quantity A both the amplitude as well as the effect of phase. So, the phase difference can be accounted for very easily and phase difference is very important when dealing with dual channel measurements or in dealing with uh, measurements which are actually product of two harmonic quantities and we shall soon see intensity is one place where this effect of uh, uh, phasors will be leading us to a very uh, important simplification. So, the algebra will be definitely much more simplified if we use this complex number algebra rather than the trigonometric form. 
in trigonometric form we have to the uh, remember trigonometric formulas associated with sin square cosine square and all those things but these formulas turn out to be much easier when we deal with uh, complex number algebra so the complex number algebra hopefully you will find it easier to use than the trigonometric so you these manipulations with trigonometric forces uh, with quantities force the analyst to use uh, trigonometric quantities if you don't use uh, the complex algebra notation rather you use the trigonometric notation then you will have to uh, sort of manipulate the trigonometric quantities which happens to be little more difficult and as we shall see probably a few classes down the line intensity calculations and impedance calculations will be turning out much easier with this analysis okay i think uh, we'll stop here for the class next class we will get deeper into the aspects of fourier analysis thank you